Well, I also wanted to just, you know, people out on the web right now, I wanted to let everyone know, if you are concerned about coming down here to Tyler, uh, Church of God International, don't be. Uh, I'm looking around right now, and everyone is being very mature about this whole thing that's going on. Um, just real quick, just to let you know, if you're one of those folks that, I don't know where, which side of this thing you're on, if you are one of these pro-mask folks, no one's going to look down on you for wearing your mask down here, okay? Um, if you're one of these people that feels like you don't need to wear a mask, well, we're okay with those people as well. Everyone is being very mature. I think this is a great group of people and brothers and sisters who are being considerate of one another, no matter how you feel about this pandemic. So come on down, you know, be with us. We promise to, to not bite, as they say. So, well, it's been crazy the last couple of months, hasn't it? Oh my goodness, it's been bizarre. Uh, I've, I've just been flabbergasted all the things that have come down the pike. For me, I'm, I'm 30, 37, and I've never seen something like this. Never seen something where the government has stepped in and has caused the schools to shut down for some you know, period of time, saying about a year for some organizations until next year. I heard John Reedy talking about this. Shutting down businesses, all kinds of stuff. And it's all from something that we can't see. Right? It's an invisible enemy. There's definitely the effects of it we can see, but it's something we can't see with the naked eye. I don't see anyone with a microscope out there, you know, they can't see it, I promise you. And it's, it's bizarre. Something we can't see having that big of an impact on our lives. It's a blind spot. And that's what I want to talk about today. More pointedly, Christian blind spots. Well, what the heck is a blind spot? Well, my buddy once said, blind spot's this. Yeah. Something that's there actually exists, but you can't see it but it affects your life. And I want to dig in a little deeper about what the heck a blind spot actually is. I want you to imagine something for me, if we can put something on the screen here for those of you who can't imagine. I want you to imagine a circle. And inside of this circle here is all of knowledge. Every single thing that's knowable is inside of this circle. From the real, the unreal, you know, from how atoms work down at the molecular levels inside of here, from how big celestial bodies in the universe interact, God's kingdom, his throne. If God had a beard, what would it look like? It's in that circle. I now want you to think about if I were to represent how much you know of that circle, how much do you think would be in there? Next slide. It's like a little little speck, right? Just a little little dot, <laughs> a little pinprick. And even that might be more generous than some of us <laughs> deserve. But for the sake of this thought experiment, I want to represent just a little wedge. Let me go to the next slide. A little wedge. This is everything of all knowledge that you actually know. For me, this includes things like, well, I know my name's Blake. I know that. Some things like, I know I know how to do arithmetic. I know how to do math, uh, addition and subtraction. And I even know how to, you know, um, speak English. Pretty good. I guess not. <laughs> well. So, I want you to draw your attention to another part of this circle. Next slide, please. This is all the things and knowledge that you know that you don't know. Okay? So this includes things like, for me, I know that I don't know how to speak Mandarin. I don't know a lick of Chinese, okay? I also know that I don't know calculus. For sure, I don't know that. I can do arithmetic, just can't do calculus. And I also know that I don't know what my wife is thinking. <laughs> it's been pointed out too many times otherwise for me to think different. But it's no, no mystery. There's things that we know. There's things that we know that we don't know. And most of academia is focused around taking stuff from the I know that I don't know section and moving it into, no, not next slide. I'm sorry, I was just pulling it. It's just moving things from the things you know that you don't know, moving it into the things you know, right? The professor will get up in front of you, beginning of the, the, uh, the year, say, all right, 
We're going to cover all these things. This is the syllabus, right? These are all the things you know you don't know. These are all the things that you're going to learn, hopefully, by the end of the semester. And then boom, you know calculus. That's how it works. I now want to draw your attention to the rest of the circle. These are all the things that you don't know that you don't know. Let me ask you, what are some things you know that you don't know? Or don't know that you don't know? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's a blind spot. Now you can concede that there are things out there that you are unaware of that do exist, right? This is where God operates for me mostly. He works in this section, in this kind of mysterious beyond. As my buddy Skip would say, you know, I didn't get an email from God this morning asking me what I should do about this, that, or the other. I don't know if any of y'all got a text message from God this morning asking anything about your opinion on something. Well, then he's operating outside your purview then. And inside of this section of knowledge and everything that's knowable is also where faith lives. We have to have faith about things that we don't know about. And unfortunately, this is also where anxiety lives. We have anxiety about things we don't know about. It's said that anxiety is the future projection of a future unknown and the fear that comes from that. And so, I want to talk about today, about this section, about the anxiety that has been pervasive in society because of this pandemic and some of the things we can do to combat it. Uh, as I've been working at CEM, we get all kinds of communications from people from around the world. And a lot of the communications lately have been about what the heck is going on. Do you think this is it? Is Jesus coming? And I tell those folks all the same thing. I don't know. No man knows. So it's, that's what the scripture says. But what's more disconcerting for me about these communications is there's this fear that's inside of these communications. There's this anxiety. There's this nervousness that's inside those communications. And I get it. And I'll tell one on myself here. A couple weeks ago, my wife and I were making dinner, and I was chopping onions for my world-famous guacamole, <laughs> which, by the way, I know we're not doing potluck, but once we are, I'm bringing some of that guacamole. <laughs> You'll have to come back and visit us <laughs> and get some of that. And I'm sitting there chopping the onions, and, you know, <sighs> Tracy looks over, she goes, you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine, why? I said, no, seriously, you okay? I'm all right, why? What's going on? Well, you keep sighing. You keep going. <laughs> so, no, I'm not. <laughs> said, well, yeah, you are. It's these onions. It's these onions. <laughs> no. You know. I said, no, you're sighing. And you've been doing it for the last couple of days. Are you okay? Everything all right at work? I said, yeah, everything's great at work. Boss is a little hard on me, but yeah, it's all right. But, no, uh, everything's fine. She said, well, what's going on then? Well, well. You know, and I just start up. I go, well, you know, all these people, they have all these people that they have tested positive, and they have this, this ticker of how many people have contracted the disease, and they haven't done mass testing, so how do they know what that number is? And, you know, there's these people that have been saying that this virus has been released in, you know, on purpose to give us this vaccine, and I went on and on. Poor Tracy was sorry she asked. <laughs> right? So I've been anxious as well. It was right there below the surface. And that's not a good thing. It's not a good thing to be anxious. It's not a good thing to be nervous. It's not a good thing for our physical health. We know that when we are anxious or we have anxiety, it releases a chemical called cortisol. It's related to a lot of different illnesses. So it's not good for our physical health to stress out and to worry. But it's also not good for our spiritual health too. There's way too much in the Bible that says otherwise. 
to basically think that it's okay for us to fret and to worry. We get passages from Jesus saying, you know, look, the lilies, they neither toss nor toil. Right? Care not for the morrow, for the morrow shall care for itself. Right? You have Paul talking about, you know, things that we, we should be, we should be confident, we should come, we're, we're given a spirit of boldness, right? We, we're being given the spirit of, uh, of you know, to, be, to be courageous. There's just too much in the Bible to say otherwise, to say it's okay for us to continue to be anxious and to, be, and to have all this anxiety. And more importantly, well, heck, let's look at it together. If you would open your Bibles to Revelation 21.6, please. Revelation 21.6. And we'll read here about those that will not receive the kingdom of heaven. And actually, this will be covering, I'm sorry, 21.8, actually. Let's pick it up at 21.8. Revelation 21.8. But the fearful and unbelieving, well, there we are. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake with, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. All right, well, great. Now I'm stressing out about stressing out. <laughs> I'm worrying about worrying. That's not good either. Now we have a catch-22 here, don't we? And it's... Um, it's hard, you know, when you're now aware of how much you're being anxious. You now, all this stuff around you, you're being bombarded with all these news stories, all this stuff going on. It's hard to not worry when you have all that there. But there's something else I want to look at. Because we know that it's, you know, we, with the fearful and the unbelieving will not, believe, will not receive the kingdom of God. But I want to also look at what Jesus does to a man who brings his son to him for healing. Let me turn your Bibles to Mark 9. 14. Mark 9, 14. And here, when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them, and scribes disputing with them. Immediately, when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed, and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son, who, was a mute, who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him and throws him down, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. And here he answered and said, and It's a bit cutting what Jesus says to him, I think a little acrid, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And I believe Jesus was talking to the disciples here because of what we find out that they were unable to cast him out due to their faith. But anyways, then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. And when he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth, he asked the father, how long has he been happening to him? How long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown himself both into the fire and to water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. It pricks my heart because, you know, I'm a father. I can imagine bringing my son to Jesus with this disease or this demon. And just how I would ache for him to be healed. And Jesus says to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. It's based on his belief that his son is about to be saved. I can imagine. Imagine the father. Immediately the father of the child cried out and answered the, to the Lord with tears. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him, and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. Man, to be that, that son's father, I couldn't imagine just having to have that belief 
and to be, you know, on the line right there that if I did not believe, my son would not be healed. But what's interesting to me is there's no notion here in this scripture or thereafter that the man had a change of heart. You know, it doesn't read later on, the man was greatly convicted in his heart and believed even more. Apparently, the man was still unbelieving and believing at the same time. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. So did he believe or didn't he believe? Can I say it's a little bit of both? Is it a, can we have two conflicting ideas in our mind like that? I think we can. I think some of us have some of that going on right now. We have this belief, but there's all this other information coming at us. There's all this stuff that is pulling on us to not believe, to have doubt, to be fearful. I think that maybe the man had a, maybe a, an anxious faith. It's an interesting idea. Another fascinating scripture we can look at about how faith works, how it pushes and pulls on us a little bit, is if we turn to Romans 12. Romans 12.3. 12, Romans 12.3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. That's interesting. God has given us a measure of faith. I would think God has given us all the same amount of faith. But it looks like here, Paul's telling the church at Rome that there is a measure of faith that's given to each one of us. And that's a fascinating idea for me. Because, well, then my mind goes to, well, I guess I was just late the day that they were handing out faith. <laughs> right? <laughs> just didn't get there in time to get enough faith to work through this. And see, it's not my fault. God didn't give me enough faith to get through this thing. And sometimes I feel like some of the church brethren has some of this kind of fatalistic determinism. You know, what will be will be. I have no part in this thing. I think intuitively, no, that's not true. We have to have something that we can do to grow our faith, to have some kind of effect on it. God has given us, I believe, a measure of faith, maybe a small measure of faith, such that we can grow that faith. As a parent, you know that you don't want to give your child everything that they need, per se, all the time. You just want to give them just enough to where they can grow for themselves, where they can make some progress for themselves. I think this is what God does for us. He knows exactly how much faith we need. But also just enough pullback to where we can then grow it. Maybe a little starter, right? A little bit of tinder to start a fire. Give you just enough of that faith to grow it. I want you to think about your faith now maybe as a muscle, right? That's something you can make your faith stronger. Work that faith muscle out. Which brings me to this other idea, which is this idea of how our body works. Our body works by a process called hormesis. It's a fancy way talking about whenever you go to work out, let's say you know, when you're wanting to get stronger, hit the gym. You jump down, you get that bar, lift that bar, you know, maybe 20, 15 times. You're all torn up. Go home, you know, go to sleep. <laughs> and what's happened there is your body has literally torn your muscles apart there. And they knit back together, not just the same strength they were before, but a little stronger than they were before. I think that's kind of how our faith might work. God's giving you a little bit of faith so you might grow it. So what do you do? You go back to the gym, and you're able to maybe slap a tin on each side, and you're able to start lifting some more muscle, you know, some more of that weight there. I think we can do that with our, with our faith as well. Hormesis is this idea that your body grows in response to the environment it's subjected to. 
You might say, well, Blake, this is not a physiological process of using your faith. Well, it is. Every thought, every emotion, every experience you have has a physiological counterpart that happens in your brain. There's a, a series of electrons that cause a fire whenever you have faith or you don't have faith. There is an actual process that God has made inside of your body to represent every emotion that you go through. So every thought that you have, every emotion you have, does actually have a counterpart in your brain. There's even this process called myelination. Myelination is this idea that whenever you fire a certain series of, of neurons and you have a certain kind of amount of chemical that's released in your brain, there's a chemical called myelin that coats over those axons and those, that neurological pathway to make it more of a regular thing. It makes it more efficient. So God even made it easier on you for the more faith you have. And we see scriptures like, you know, to he that has much more will be given, starts to make a little more sense. Because the more you do this stuff, the more faithful you are, the easier it gets. You know, you, you might be around some of these people that just seem to be stalwart individuals. They have faith no matter what. And usually those guys, those folks, those ladies, are usually, they've been, a, they've been through it. They've been through a lot of things in life. And usually they have been working out a whole lot, spiritually thinking. They haven't been sitting on the couch watching TV and bonbons, right? Eating all that spiritual bunk, junk food, subjecting themselves to, what's the death toll now? You know, clicking on that, uh, you know, refresh button or whatever, you know. Um, they are stalwart individuals because they have been faithful and they've been through some things. So I want to give you some suggestions. I want this to be an encouraging message a little bit, hopefully, about some spiritual workouts that you can take on. Maybe you can work out that spiritual, that faith muscle. And maybe you can try on a couple of these things to build your faith. I want to urge us to all think about it in a way that we have control over the amount of faith we can build. To take every thought captive, as they say. So my first suggestion would be to, to turn the screens off, y'all. <laughs> Please, take a little time off. Um, everyone, I don't care what screen, you got the TV screen, you got your phone screen, you got your computer screen, and a lot of them are all screaming through those screens about how terrible, awful everything is and how fearful you need to be. Well, I guess I should be afraid then, all right, you know, stop it. For myself, I take a little bit of time, at least on the Sabbath, I turn off everything. I unplug. That's my thing for the Sabbath. No Facebook. No TV. That's for me. I'm not saying that's a problem for anyone else. You know, you do what you do, but I'm just saying for myself, I at least take the Sabbath off. Um, I get myself away from, um, I try to, I have to get my phone on me, but I try to stay away from my phone as much as possible. You, you know, there's all this stuff that happens from the blue light, I don't know, from your phones and all the screens. It triggers your dopamine. Anyways, it, it's dope. You know, you're, you're addicted to it. And so take some time off. Detox <laughs> from all all of the bad news out there. And for those of you that are on Facebook, don't be afraid to pull someone up and hit that snooze button on them. The snooze button says you give them 30 days to where you're not going to hear or see anything from them. I know that there's some people on my friends list who are giving me all kinds of crazy conspiracy theory stuff that are just driving me nuts. You know, is this, is this information going to change what I'm doing tomorrow? No. All right? So take some time off. That's not an action. It's more of an inaction. Right? But you should be proactive in not subjecting yourself to as much of all of the stuff that's going on on the, on the news and the media. Pull yourself back a little bit from all that. Secondly, I would like for you to suggest that you take some time each day to meditate on some of the things that God has done for you. Now let me be clear. I want you to think about some of the things that God has actually done that you're actually grateful for. Not some of the things that you should be grateful for. There's a lot of things we should be grateful for, be grateful for but I think these are things that you in your heart of hearts are really actually thankful for. What I mean by that is 
I am actually very thankful for my wife and what she puts up with with me. I love her to death. She's an amazing woman. And I really can, at any time, in any moment, I can just think about how grateful I am about that. My son, you know, that he's in my life, that I have him, is something I'm actually grateful for. In a moment, I can turn the anxiety around to gratitude, if only for a moment. That's a pattern interrupt. It stops all that, that anxiety and all the nervousness. You know, if you're in, you might be in the middle of something that you are in an anxious situation where it might be the news, might be a conversation with someone that you are maybe at odds with. You can in that moment almost turn that on by thinking about those things you're grateful for. It's amazing. Try it out. Just experiment with it. But you have to take some time and set it aside, maybe with your coffee in the morning. Spend a little bit of time talking to God about how happy you are. I usually say, you know, how happy I am that he even thought about me to be a part of his plan. That's something I'm actually thankful for. You know, Paul tells the, the church at Philippi, you know, in 4.8, you know, <laughs> finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. I think that's a part of it right there too, to take some time to actually consciously think about some good in the world. For me, I have a long list of people I pray for. You know, I try to keep everyone in mind and usually it's about some of the things it's not a lot of praise reports it's a lot of things that are going wrong and bad and terrible and awful for these folks and that can tax you that can tax your faith so try to be equal parts praying for people that have some bad things going on for them and also some of the praise reports as well you know thankfulness along with some of the things that you would like to see happen for some of these people that are going through some hard times lastly I would suggest that we do a good turn for a stranger now and then. A complete stranger. Don't know him from Adam. The stranger, the better. <laughs> the harder, the better. The more it takes you out of your way, the better. You see someone on the side of the road, stop off. Check on them. Be the expression that God has got your back. You know God has you. You're, you're fine. You got it. At least what I do is I just, I pull over and say, you know, you all right, everything okay? You need me to make a phone call for some, you know, to someone, to AAA? Just, just do that, you know? I know that ladies, you don't want to you know, stop off and it could be dangerous, but just, you can at least offer to, to make a phone call for them, all right? I've seen so many times when I've done that, you know, the look in the other person's eye usually is just very telling, you know, kind of. You know, they, that this person would stop and take an interest that I was doing okay makes them feel good, you know? Makes them feel like there is some good in the world. Maybe, maybe not everyone's terrible and awful. Maybe you do something anonymous for some folks that are having some financial hard times. Right now, more than ever, people are having a hard time financially. Do it anonymously. And that's great because you end up for me, there's this interaction when you do something nice for someone else. There's this moment in time where we're, we're connected, you know, where we, we are both brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter if they're a believer or not, that we're, there's some good out there, and we can be the good. So do some good for someone out there. Again, the stranger the better. And that way, when your head hits that pillow at night, Maybe you'll be saved from some of those thoughts. You know, the thoughts you think when you're staring at that one spot in the ceiling, playing out every dastardly scenario, planning people's funerals, maybe yourself, your own funeral. And you get some sleep about five minutes before the alarm goes off, right? But maybe you'll be saved from that if you've done some good in the world, that you've helped out some people in this world you've done good by building that faith muscle. <clears throat> Leave you with this. 
It's one of my favorite things Ron said. He said, folks, I've read the book, and in the end, we win. <laughs>